Good afternoon. I welcome you back. So up till now, you've been listening to leading academicians and leaders from the business. This session is about innovation from areas beyond business. And let me tell you, we'll have some unheard of, unheard of stories of innovation from the world of sports coming up very soon. On that note, I'd like to invite Mr. Joy Bhattacharya. He's a project director of FIFA Under-17 World Cup 2017, the first ever FIFA tournament in India, and the very first FIFA tournament in which an Indian team will participate. Prior to that, he was a team director for the Kolkata Knight Riders and had two IPL trophies to remember in an amazing seven years, in which he had a ringside view of one of the world's most popular leagues. He was a head of programming for both the History Channel and National Geographic Channel for South Asia and ESPN Star Sports for first Indian head of production. He has produced live cricket for the Asia Cup, India's Tour of Australia, live hockey for the Premier Hockey League and National Team Games, and live football for the IFA Shield. This is interesting. He, made, he has made Sunil Gavaskar answer quiz questions. Shekhar Suman do Hindi commentary and shocked Sachin by having Mark Knopfler from the Dire Straits call him live on a show. He co-wrote a cricket fiction for young adults with his then 12-year-old son, and he says he got far more brownie points, he as in his son, in the school after it was published. He writes a column on sports for the Economic Times and a quiz column for the Business Line Weekend Edition. He confesses to a math and master's in computer application from Jadavpur University, however, mostly spent on basketball and college canteen. Can I please invite Mr. Joy Bhattacharya on the stage? Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Can you hear me? Is it clear? Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for being here. And as I said, my session is going to be about innovation in sport. And I want to start off with a man who was one of the greatest innovators of his times, a gentleman called Swami Vivekanand, who at a time when conventional Hinduism was saying, you don't even cross the ocean because aapka jat nikal jayega, he was going to the World Congress in Chicago and talking about Hinduism to the world. So innovation is not just a 20th century term or even a 21st century term. That's a man who started it a long, long time before. And when he started talking about innovation, one of the things he said was, you'll be nearer to heaven through football than through the study of the Gita. Now, that's a very interesting quote. And I will always remember this quote all my life because it helped me get $2.5 million from the government. Actually, what uh, happened was we were going there and meeting the government about how they could support the World Cup and do stuff. And there was a secretary of sports at that time who said, you know what, sport has to be like this. In fact, Swami Vivekananda said, and I said, sir, can you just hold on for a second? I want to show you the first slide of my presentation. I showed him that slide. I don't think he saw anything else in my presentation. Then he said, okay, okay, okay do, this, do this project. Okay. So later today, I'm going to tell you about what we do because that's fairly innovative. But one of the great things about sport is, is sport is the ultimate innovation. Because compared to everything else, result, win, lose, it's very immediate. Okay? You see results happen in front of you. You see changes happen in front of you. So in, in some ways, you can say in sport, it's like innovation on speed as compared to any other industry. So you know, people talk about it. And you know, I've had eight years working with uh, the Kolkata Knight Riders, seven years actually. And they say that, you know, the good old sport, you know, cricket in its original sport. So you know where I always start off with? I start off with this. So whenever people talk about cricket, that was cricket. Women in the 17th century, they started off wearing hoop skirts. Not too many men played. And they actually started off, this is how a game used to be played, and this is how the game was played. Now, if you played this today, I don't think you're going to get too many television audiences. So, Sometime in the 18th century, somebody figured out that, OK, you can bowl a ball over arm. After that, somebody figured out that, you know what? This track needs to be covered. The ball was standardized. Clubs started happening. And if we had not innovated on cricket, this is what cricket would have been, as opposed to this. This is what you see in cricket today. So all of this is a series of innovations made over time, one by one by one by one by one which have changed the way we looked at the game. And innovation, therefore, in, is necessary for sport. Because you see, what happens is 
Sport is the one thing which is not a necessity. It's not. You don't need to. And in India, for the long, longest time, we haven't had so much sport. Why? Because very honestly, as a country, we used to tell ourselves, boss, roti, kapra, and makan hai. We have so many 300 million people, 500 million people. We need education. We need food. We need all that. Sport came later only because it is not considered a necessity. And therefore, sport in its own way needs to be the most innovative. Because hey, you don't tell a kid, play this sport. He's going to play it. You force him to play it for a while. He's going to play something else if the sport does not interest him. So sport must innovate, must attract, must keep remaining relevant. And you know, the tragedy of our times is that we talk about cricket. If we had a three-hour format in cricket that worked 20 years before, then cricket would be played seriously probably in 50 countries, not in the 11 or 12 that it is now. That's the truth of the matter. The fact is that we did not have a product that could go out and say, just like a baseball game or like a cinema, I go out in the evening with my kid, go out a match, come back. So this is probably the innovation. In the next 20 years, you might see cricket now going seriously to many countries because we have finally innovated to reach a format where we have something. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take specific examples of innovation in sport and then take you to something which is very close to my heart, which is the kind of innovation we are doing here and then open it up for questions. But first, I want to say that the very essence of innovation is, is very, very deep, and it starts much deeper. So do you know what this is called? Huddle. Any idea why, why we huddle? Anyone? Coordination, OK. Anything else? Exchange strategy. What else? When do you think the huddle started? Number? 20 years back, 50 years back? 2003? OK. So the huddle started, and there is actually a date for it. The huddle started in 1882. OK. It was started by a group of people in a college called, I think it's called Gallaudet College. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it properly. And do you know why it started? It had nothing to do with emotion and energy and last minute instructions. What was the truth was, Galaudet College was a college for the hearing impaired. Okay? So what happened was, they in Galaudet College says, if the coach has to say anything to the team, the other team could see their hand signals, because that's how they talk. So they said, how the hell can I talk to my guys without people watching me? So they made a huddle. And that's how the huddle started. And this is a perfect example of an innovation which was very, very relevant to something which was a 19th century college coach's problem. And then people figured out that, OK, this is a last minute thing. It's emotional. It gives you an emotional charge. And that's why we've adapted it. So fascinatingly, something that was innovated about in that many years back has now again come back into fashion. So innovation is always driven by two, three things. One of the things that drives innovation, as I said, is necessity. In this case, it was necessity. You had a college student, a college coach who could not talk to his people. And every time there's a problem or a situation, that's one of the first starting points of innovation. The second is, as I said, saving a sport. So here's a lovely story. What you'll see in front of you, what you're seeing is, that's a man called Imran Khan. And many, many years back, he wore a t-shirt which used to be really cool. It used to be, say, big boys play at night. Okay? And obviously, the, you know, the connotations are obvious. What happened was, in 1977, a man called Kerry Packer bid for the rights to cricket. And the Australian board says, we're not giving it to you. So Packer says, hey, I don't care. I'll go and buy the players, and I'll make my own series. So in those days, the best players in the world, you know, the only India didn't sign up, Gavaskar and Vishwanath are approached, but they didn't sign up. But the best West Indian players, the best Australian players, from Chapel to Holding to Lloyd, all of them went and joined this World Series cricket. But do you know what happened as a result? He figured out that the official Australian game is in the daytime. How do I make this game attractive to people? Secondly, the actual what we call hardcore cricket viewer was very appalled. You know, for him, it was a country-by-country -country game. 
I don't want to have, these are mercenaries playing cricket. So what's your problem? Your problem is, I'm not official, okay? The hardcore supporters of this sport do not want to watch me because they think I'm anti-social or anti-national. And three is the standard problem with all cricket had, I'm playing during the damn day. Nobody watches from 10 to 5, who's going to give up game? So what he did was, he said two things. First, I've got to get more new audiences. I got to get women and children to come and watch this sport. I'm going to get people to watch cricket who haven't watched cricket before. And the first thing he did was colored clothing. Now, I know that the West Indies didn't particularly like the choice of their color, okay? But the truth of it was, this was the first time in a cricket match, in a cricket field, instead of pristine whites, you saw oranges and blues and pinks and purples because that's what they needed to do to get new audiences. There was never a drinks break like that, but Kerry Packer needed to have a drinks break because that's where you, know, you could have nice looking girls wheel it out, audiences would come. All this is made because he's not caught the traditional cricket lover, nor does he have the time. And what did he do in the third? He said, I can't afford to just play in the daytime. I'm going to play day-night matches. How do I promote day-night matches? I'm going to get people like Imran Khan wear t-shirts saying, big boys play at night. So all this happened because of the necessity of him having to take on the establishment and take on a sport where the situation is that he cannot do anything. He is the outsider. And look what he did. He gave colored clothing. Can you even imagine a T20 game now with white clothing? You cannot imagine the T20 game. He gave a day-night format. The day-night format was not there before him. And he gave really the important thing. Everything that television has today started from there. The scorecards, they had to be interesting. The drinks break so more advertisers can come in. Everything, the duck. If you remember, Australia used to be famous for that duck. Little daddles, the duck. Every time anyone got out in zero, they threw a duck. Everything came from a need because he was the outsider. And this is how innovation is forced. So first, innovation is forced by need. Not just pers one is personal need, but then innovation is also driven by the need to attract new audiences. And in sport, that's extremely relevant because sporting audiences change the fastest. They keep moving on. And if your sport is not keeping up with it, you're in trouble. So that's one part of innovation. Another part of innovation, take a look at this. Now, that's Tim Duncan. That's a basketball match. But the single most important thing in this picture that you'll see is the number 11. And do you know why? In old days, basketball matches did not have any time. So what happened is, I'm playing a really good team. I'll just hold on to the ball for as long as I can. I will not shoot the damn ball. Because you're a better team. If you get the ball, you're going to shoot it back. So they had a situation where a basketball match of 40 minutes ended with one team winning 19-18. He said, man, the sport will die. The sport is going to die tomorrow if we have this. So what did they do? They turned around and they said, we've got to figure a way out. They got a mathematician in, a chap called uh, this thing, uh, David Buzia. And what he did was, he sat and he crunched the numbers and he said, in 40 minutes, we should have about 120 shots a game. If it's 120 shots a game, how much time should we give a player? And they said, 24 seconds is the time a team has to shoot in. So every time you see a basketball game happening, that clock will tell you how much time is left before the team needs to shoot. But basketball, the ratings from here on change dramatically. Suddenly from boring games where people were holding on to balls and standing, the game started moving because you had to move in 24 seconds. People started to press forward. More mistakes were made, more action made. The whole game changed on the basis of those two numbers up there. So that's how sport innovates out of necessity, okay? But not just sport, people also innovate, and this is a great example of personal innovation. What you're seeing there is something called the straddle, okay? And the big thing about the straddle is, this is how high jumping used to happen. And everyone, when they did high jumping, they'd jump, and then they'd cross it like that. Now there's, if you go today, this is how people jump. Because there was a man called Dick Fosbury who turned around and said that if I want to jump, the angle at which I approach, every time that I try and straddle it, I will never get the results that I do if I jump backwards. 
And do you know the funniest thing about it? The only reason he kept competing and he kept telling his coaches, I'll do it this way. His coaches kept stopping him. The only time that he managed to get his way through was when he went to the University of Oregon and he said, I need just one thing. I need a safe mat on the other side. Because I'm going over my back. If I miss something, I'll kill myself. So in 1968, he goes out there and competes with all these people and they're wondering what this strange technique is. Not only does he win and creates a record in the process, by 1972, the 40 jumpers who were competing in the Olympics, 28 of them were using this. It's called the Fosbury flop invented by Dick Fosbury. So that's how even individual innovation in sport can be just game changers like that. They come in, somebody gets an idea, somebody sees a concept, but the beauty of sport is the speed of change. It changes immediately because moment somebody discovered that this is a better technique, they were on to the next one. Similarly, switch hit. This is invented by Kevin Peterson. Why? Kevin Peterson had a huge problem reading Muthaya Mullidharan. Every time Kevin Peterson used to, Muthaya Mullidharan used to bowl into his pads, he had no way to hit the ball. So he says, if he can change a ball, he can bowl a straight ball, he can bowl a dusra, he can bowl a tisra. Hey, I can switch a bat. So the funniest thing was that they tried to stop him for the longest time from doing it. But if you watch cricket today, cricket especially, limited overs cricket is without the switch hit, is not usable. So this is again innovation out of a need to surmount a particular situation. And then taking that innovation and taking it forward. Today, if you see any international cricketer, you know, in the nets, we I used to work with the Kolkata Knight Riders. And Jacques Callis used to be there with me and used to watch the youngsters. And he used to watch them practicing switch hits in the, in the nets. And he'd just look and he'd shake his head. <laughs> but that's what it is. Today, if you don't have a switch hit, you cannot play international cricket limited overs. You cannot. It's a necessary skill to play international cricket. So innovation in sport is, as I said, driven by necessity, has a great deal of speed, and is very, very, very quickly adapted. So how do we take things forward? There's also innovation for fans, because the truth of it is, one great thing about sport, as I told you before, is sport does not have a fixed audience. Table tennis, for example, terrific sport to play. But it's rubbish to watch on television. You cannot watch TT on television. You know what they did? They made the ball larger so that they made it heavier so that it slowed down the play. Because they said TT was so fast, people couldn't watch it. But they still couldn't get audiences onto table tennis. This is another great example where I say it's not just a question of innovation, it's a question of innovation all through. So there's a stadium in San Francisco called the Levi Stadium. And you know what it does? It has an app. So you'll say, okay, what's big about an app? Everyone has an app. So this app tells you when you come into the Levi Stadium, which is the closest parking space you have available right now? What are the lines at each of the food counters? So the beer counter has so many people standing, so and so has so many people standing, so you can check who's there. What are the lines in the bathroom? Okay. Also, it's giving you four instant replays of every, ma of every game as you're watching it on your phone as well. So here's an example of saying that I cannot just, it's not just up to sport to innovate, it's not just up to individuals to innovate. As an industry, I must be able to innovate. And this is the prototype for sport of the future. Because today, nobody is going to just, nobody just watches sport. They second screen sport. That means I have the TV in front of me, but right next to me, I'll have an iPad or a phone in which I'm arguing with my friends, I'm messaging, I'm checking up stats. This is the ideal second screen sitting in the stadium. This is a stadium built for the future. So, so far I've been talking about taking you through examples which are very much international examples of innovation. I'll take you on to one thing which is, as I said, a very pet project of ours. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's called Mission 11 Million. So it starts from a very, very simple place. It starts from the place that we turned around and we said, if the World Cup is happening in India, it's a 22-day tournament. It starts on the 6th, sends on the 28th. How can we make a difference beyond that? And what we did was we said, in one year, you can't teach people to play football. But we learned that there were two very important things. So we said, how do you improve football in India? So you turn around and you say that the model in 11 World Cups have been won by European countries. Lots of money, lots of practice facilities, fitness, everything. But hold on, nine of them have been won by South American countries. 
And let me tell you, the nutrition there is no better than ours. Okay? The kind of facilities there are worse than ours. If you think Indian stadiums are shambolic, you have not seen South American stadiums. And the overall money in the sport is not at all high. People like Ronaldo and Pele started playing on the streets. So our first learning was, what's the big problem? What is then the difference between them and us? Chile is number five in the world. We are 125. How is it so different? And the answer that we came to was the fact that they had the passion from the sport at the very core. And it's not the kids' passion. Kids will always have passion. The problem was the passion. So this is a program going around the country. The problem is the gatekeepers. So the schools, sports teachers, parents are gatekeepers. Sports teachers are enablers. Schools are the people who give facilities. Because see, the best system in our country that works is schools. It's the most efficient pipeline in our country. So if we have to get kids to play, schools must feel they also benefit from it. So the first big thing we did was change the ecosystem of the sport. So we, when we are spreading this mission 11 million, we are not going to the Department of Sports because that's preaching to the converted. We are working with the Department of Education saying, here's how your schools can benefit. We are doing seminars with sports teachers so we're doing seminars with school principals and head of departments and coaches. Why? Because if the principal doesn't buy on, you and I know that the lowest person in a school is a PT teacher. Unfortunately, he is just above the Darwan, sometimes lower as well. Okay? So to get them, I need the principal to say, you know what, your school could feature on FIFA. This is what could happen. You could get publicity here. Benefits are given to principals as well. To the PD teacher, I said, you register kids. You get them on, you play them. You're going to make a difference. And you will get chance to get coaching programs. You will get chance to win Adidas merchandise. We incentivize them as well. And then we tell them to do work in their school. And then we do a Shebang football festival. So this is the first thing. Empowering gatekeepers have to be empowered. Gatekeepers have to be incentivized as well. So that was the first thing that we're doing. Instead of spreading a sports program through the Department of Sports, we're actually using the Department of Education as our pipeline. And there's a second big thing which is bizarre, which you know you think is completely intuitive and reasonable, but people don't do. Nowhere in the world, if you had a field which is a full-size field, you know, where a Manchester United plays a Manchester City, 22 kids can play on it, that's ridiculous. Because kids below the age of 15 shouldn't even be playing 11 on 11. They don't have the physical fitness to actually use a hall that big. What you really need in that field is you can break it up into eight fields, have five on five footballs, far more contact, far more able. Kids are far more able to play it. And instead of having 22 kids playing, you are having 150 kids playing together. The other thing it does is it opens up the most important thing for us, which is infrastructure. So we're telling schools, you don't need a ground to play. You don't need brick grounds to play. You can play in a cement surface like that. You can play in a grass field like that. You can play on a mud ground. A table tennis, a, a big classroom is good enough to play three and three, four and four football. And that is something that we are saying kids need to play. Every kid should play. Kids should play. Wherever there's a chance, substitute them. Every kid should play. It's not about the five good kids in your class. And as you said, you know, when we see it, this is where the differential happens in all this. And uh, we did this program in Goa. And now it's being rolled across, uh, across the country. So these are some of the things that happened kids actually playing in a class, what they thought was impossible. And kids just playing, you know, it, at whatever age. And this is the picture that, for me, is all about what we want to do. This is a school in Goa which had never had football in its life. And remember one thing, that girls' football, women's football in India, India's ranked about 75 places higher in women than men. Our chances of qualifying for the 2019 Women's World Cup is a real challenge, is a real chance. And this is what changes, where a nun in a habit kicks off the first ball in the school that is football game that has ever been played in the school. And that's how we plan to make a difference. So there was a video, but I don't think we'll play it. This is what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. Questions? So once again, we'll stick to the theme of two questions, please.
Hi, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I've been a sports passionate player myself. I've played for, uh, cricket for my school, for my district as well. Uh, my only question is that, sir, I, for all the different sports you're doing, all the innovation and uh, all the different concepts, what, what do you think about the athletics, uh, athletics, especially the field track games? Why is India so behind? There has been, uh, I, I can't remember a, a 100 meter or a 200 meter champion coming in the last 5, 10 years. What's your take on that? Where are we lacking behind that, sir? It's a very valid question. I'd say that athletics, unfortunately, is one of the few sport where physical uh, body weight and this thing matters, fast twitch fibers. There are lots of those things that matter. Typically, it's been dominated by Jamaica, by the African countries. We apparently, our culture or our body shapes are better for middle distance. But the problem is, you see the big problem in any sport in India is it needs to be sexy. Because you're competing with 15 other budgets, 15 other sports, 15 other places. So the problem is, for it to be sexy, somebody needs to go and get results. So for example, to give you a very good example, wrestling is sexy today. You know, thanks to Dangal, thanks to whatever is happening. So it's attracting attention. The truth of it is that I'd love to say that government of India should give so much money towards athletics, but they'd give it once, they'd give it twice. You're not going to get results once or twice. So for the ecosystem to develop, it has to start, the Athletics Federation has to start small, start building up, and then creating stuff. At this point in time, they will not be a priority simply because nobody feels there's a need. And I think that's the essential issue. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant presentation, Mr. Bhattacharya. Um, just wanted to ask you, you spoke about, uh, and this is very interesting, going through the Ministry of Education rather than the Ministry of Sport, but the basic gatekeepers are the parents. So have you really thought about that? And you mentioned Dangal. So I was just wondering whether, you know, uh, as part of this entire effort, maybe funding a couple of movies like Dangal could make that kind of a behavioral change that you're speaking of. Absolutely. Uh, very, very relevant point. Uh, that's the interesting part. So exactly that, and I, uh, I'm glad you brought it up because I forgot to mention it. So what we're doing is a lot of the prizes that we're giving the kids for the festivals and the program are actually designed to parents. So one of our sponsors say there's a bank which is a sponsor. There's a tourism corporation in every state. So for example, a tourism corporation is giving me 200 holidays. So when a kid goes home and says, you know what, I've won a package holiday for four for the family for two days. That's a changer. That's a game changer, not just for that family, for 30 other families around it, for 30 other schools around it. And that's what we are doing with this, that a lot of the prizes, as you completely this thing, the gatekeepers are the parents, the gatekeepers are the teachers, principals. PD teachers are just, they are enablers, but they're not powerful. We have to open the gates. Without opening the gates, the rest can't happen. So we are focusing completely on that. Thank you.